I visited the United States uh, in May. I visited Detroit to attend APEC and also IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic for a framework meeting. Uh, the first thing that Gina Romano, the US uh, Secretary of Commerce, said, uh, one of the things that she said was basically, because we shut down the firms or we shut down factories in Penang and in Malaysia, other parts of Malaysia during MCO, uh, factories in Detroit had to shut down. That's the linkages. We contributed almost a quarter of US semiconductor trade, and we are about 5% of a global semiconductor trade, much as we are at the low end uh, in our back end. Broadly, what we are seeing now, what we are seeing now is a major departure of what we have seen in the last 20 years. Over the, over the last, well, let's say, if we begin in 20, uh, 2001. In 2001, China joined WTO. And there was a period of time where there were very little investment into manufacturing in Malaysia and around the region. So for quite an extended period of time, manufacturing investment went into China and very little else came to this region. And Malaysia played at the low end we were, we, I mean, essentially, Malaysia, the Malaysian economy over the last 20 years was about low productivity, low wage, with foreign workers, uh, with, with very little uh, improvement in productivity. But things have changed massively. The world is no longer about just in time, the world is now about just in case. And we're now seeing uh, de risking, decoupling, moving away from China, China plus one, China for China market. Uh, Outside China, uh, Asia minus China, a different set of arrangement. Redundancy is uh, being built in order to deal with a more complicated world. We are seeing massive investment initially in Vietnam from around 2017 onwards because of the, the tariff imposed by Trump, as well as because of uh, increased wages in China around 2015, 2016 and, and, and that period of time. But now, increasingly, a lot has come into Malaysia, particularly in the semiconductor industry. How do we position Malaysia? And how do we envisage and understand what is going on? Number one, I think we must understand that Malaysia occupies an indispensable middle in Southeast Asia. Very often, I hear people saying that, oh, we're competing with Vietnam, we're competing with Indonesia. But essentially, if you look into Southeast Asia seriously, uh, the Malaysian economy uh, is not as complex as, or as sophisticated as Singapore. Uh, Singapore is a lot more developed, uh, and we, we acknowledge that. But at the same time, Malaysia is in the middle because we are not a country with demographic dividend. We do not have demographic dividend like Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines, and Vietnam. But we do have most of the things that Singapore has, as well as Singapore, that Singapore doesn't have. We have land, Singapore doesn't have land. And essentially, we have the same set of workforce as Singapore has, except that you have to pay two-thirds of Singapore pay and not one-third of Singapore pay. So we occupy an indispensable middle in Southeast Asia, and we think that in the years to come, uh, we are in very different situation compared to the last 20 years. Malaysia, if we get it right, this is an opportunity for a second economic takeoff. We had the first economic takeoff between 1988 and 1997. And of course, that ended with Asian financial crisis, with the political crisis of Prime Minister Anwar being sacked as deputy Prime Minister in 1998. And that has been, and we have been in this uh, neither here nor there situation for a good 25 years. Now we believe that if we can actually get it right, and as long as there's no war in the world, or at least no war in this part of the region, which is something that no one can guarantee. With the current situation, we will have to deal with, of course, US-China US -China, uh, rivalry. And US-China rivalry will color investment decision, will color economic policy, will color geopolitics, geopolitics for the years to come. But under those circumstances, we think that 
there is an opportunity for Malaysia to reindustrialize. And that is the background of the new industrial master plan. The background of the new industrial master plan is such that we understand that we are in a new situation where geopolitics play a very important role in economic decision, in investment decision. Number two, there is major concern of uh, ESG, of climate, and, and, uh, and various issues associated with, with climate. And that will have a cascading effect on our industry, and we must be prepared for that. Thirdly, we also understand that digitalization, automation, technological adoptions are very important. So broadly, this economic, uh, sorry, this new, new industrial master plan decided to take a different approach compared to the previous approaches. Previously, we were mainly sectorial focused. But in this NIMP, we have decided to take a mission-based approach. There are four missions. The first is to increase the economic complexity of our economy. We do not want to just play at the low end. We do not want to just uh, engage in rebatch and uh, re-exporting. Re we want value adding. And of course, that you, you have questions of whether we are just playing at the back end or actually we, we are doing something more. Secondly, we want to uh, do what we call tech up. The word tech up means more automation, more adoption of technology, more digitalization, and hopefully more innovation. The third mission is to deal with net zero and to deal with the question of climate. And that is also another area where we, we would like to achieve something. And the fourth one is on economic inclusivity and economic security. So we are hoping that this will be our new dashboard. And of course, when I use dashboard, I'm very careful. It's not a computer dashboard. We are trying to mean that there needs to be a new impact assessment or new way of assessing investment, uh, the impact of investment onto our economy compared to just looking at the approved amount that has actually come into the, 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 the country. So broadly, these are the approaches that we are pursuing. And uh, we hope that with the government taking a, a clear, uh, sending this clear signal that we are keen on reindustrialization and we are keen on reindustrialization that will bring in high value investment, not just from foreign investors, but also from domestic investors. And with a keen eye on deepening, deepening uh, domestic linkages. That means we, we do not just want to return to what it was, which is mainly MNC driven, but with very little localization. We want to see that there, are, there will be a lot more domestic linkages. There will be a lot more supply chain, uh, what they call effort, in order, to, in order to create a strong Malaysian uh, supply chain or at least a regional supply chain, uh, in the hope that in the years to come, we build a more resilient economy for Southeast Asia. When I engage with the Chinese, when I engage with the US uh, officials, I've been telling them, I say, uh, what do you want to see in Malaysia and in Southeast Asia in the next 5, 10, 15 years? It's not just that we, are, we want to see Malaysia re-emerging as the main production site. We think that we will re-emerge as a major production site for global, uh, global manufacturing, particularly in SME, uh, particularly in, in, in uh, semiconductor. But it is very important that in the years to come, all this effort of reindustrializing will contribute to the emergence of a Malaysian and Southeast Asian middle class. Why I say so? Because if you go back to history, just 20 years ago, before China joined WTO, China had about 100 million middle class. But today, China has about 400 million middle class. Imagine that with concentrated investment, with the right set of labor policy, uh, we will be able to create a middle-class society in Malaysia and hopefully in Indonesia, in Thailand, uh, in Vietnam, and other Southeast Asian countries. So with that, I, I thank you very much. I, I, want to, I would like to respond uh, with your permission and hopefully introduce uh, 
uh, two paradigm shift. The first point I would like to make is that, uh, in my view, particularly for the semiconductor industry, there is no talent problem from in Malaysia. There is only a pay problem. Okay, as, at least for the semiconductor industry. You can pay two thirds of Singapore pay, you can get anyone. Yes. But of course, to reach two thirds is a negotiation. Okay, so I've been telling some uh, industrial park, uh, what they call manager or developers, I say it is time for you not to build foreign labor quarters. It's time for you to build a hostel, decent hostel for Malaysian engineers and Malaysian uh, technicians. So that even if those operate in your industrial park cannot pay two thirds of Singapore pay, they can pay half of Singapore pay with accommodation for engineers. They may stay back because we must accept that. And this is where where uh, I have been trying to impress upon investors whenever I meet them. We must accept that the Malaysian labor market and Singapore labor market is a single labor market. And I I can attest to it because. My constituencies, my parliamentary constituency and state constituency is at the doorstep, doorstep of Singapore. <laughs> Our factories are competing with two, uh, what they call, outflow. One, of course, the engineers to Singapore. Second, technician to become... Uh, our factories are competing and losing technicians to grab and to food tender. Okay? All because, all because we have, a, we have an outdated view about pay, which is why in the new industrial master plan, one of the three outcomes that we hope to see is that by 2030, manufacturing medium wage will reach 4,510 ringgit. In 2021, manufacturing, uh, what they call the manufacturing medium wage was 1,976 ringgit. In 2022, manufacturing medium wage is 2,205 ringgit, whereas medium wage in 2022 was 2,424 ringgit. We are one of the rare countries in which manufacturing medium wage is lower than general medium wage. In most countries, manufacturing sector is the most advanced sector. Therefore, manufacturing medium wage are usually so much more higher than general medium wage, but we are a reality because we have a pay problem. The second uh, mindset shift or paradigm shift that I would like to introduce is the whole idea how we see our relationship with Singapore and with the more uh, demographic, uh, what they call the uh, more, more the populated neighbors like Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. We have been told to compete with our neighbors. But actually, as a uh, uh, YJC, you see, none of us can take the capacity of China individually. Okay? When the flow comes to Southeast Asia and to India, to home shoring, to uh, Mexico and uh, Poland, Malaysia cannot take up the entire capacity that is coming out from China. Neither do Singapore, neither do, do uh, does Indonesia. So we will have to see how to integrate with the Singapore economy, how to integrate with the Indonesian economy better. And Malaysia occupied an indispensable middle. We can integrate better with Singapore. If we can also integrate better with Indonesia or Vietnam, we become a vertical inter integration in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia becomes a vertical inter integration with Malaysia in the middle and we present a supply chain uh, a better supply chain, a secure supply chain, a resi resilient supply chain to investors. And I think this is time for uh, a, a new phase of regional integration that we have not seen in the last 20 to 25 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh as, far, as far as the size of the semiconductor industry, I think it's right clear. 10 years ago, uh, a car would use less on, uh, 10 years ago, the car would only use half of the chips that we are using now on an ICE car, not to mention EV. So the size of the semiconductor industry, even if we do not talk about computer, even if we do not talk about uh, what they call uh, the gadget, car alone, uh, each car has doubled its, uh, the number of uh, chips that uh, it is used 
within the last decade or so. Uh, and of course, the EV, uh, I mean, EV is a, a car EV is also a computer. Uh, so that the fact that you will, the size of the semiconductor industry will, will balloon uh, is, is quite evident. Question of whether Malaysia has capability to innovate. I would say that Malaysia has capability to innovate, but whether it is registered as Malaysian IP uh, is a separate issue. Because most of the innovation that is done in, for example, uh, a company that starts with I in Penang are registered as an American uh, IP. Uh, but they are all done by Malaysian engineers. So the question is whether we can actually uh, help industries to localize and to, to source supply from Malaysia and from around the region uh, and also to encourage a lot more IC design, uh, to encourage a lot more uh, Malaysian IPs. I think those are, the, those are the issues that the Malaysian government and the industry will have to deal with. Now, for as I say, for about 20 years, the world was looking to China to source. So even if the MNC was in Malaysia, they were sourcing from China. But now, China, to many, many of these companies, are not necessarily an option. Uh, and, and this is an opportunity for Malaysia to, to move up, to move up the, the innovation ladder and to, uh, to ensure that there are more Malaysian IPs and, uh, and with the capability that we already have. Uh, I, again, I want to bring back to the larger background. Uh, they used to be China uh, as, a, as an option, as a, as a, as a benchmark. So wages were compared with China's wages uh, during the period of uh, 2001 to up to about 2017. Today, wages are no longer benchmarked with, uh, with uh, what they call China because China has become so expensive uh, to operate. And of course, uh, for many, many uh, what they call industry, they would like to compare with Vietnam, which is why I say Malaysia has to move to, to a higher end so that we are not comparing with Vietnam. We are forming a vertical integration with Vietnam, uh, and we must uh, engage the industry so that they benchmark with pay in US and pay in Euro. For example, Infineon would like Infineon to benchmark the Malaysian pay with Euro and with uh, US pay, so that to see that actually you're only paying a fraction of what you're paying uh, to an engineer in Munich or in, in Germany. So that mindset shift is very important and we must position Malaysia as a, as a unique place that is no, nowhere else in the region because otherwise we are just the same as other, other countries. Likewise, as far as global minimum tax is concerned, uh, we also need a mindset shift. For the last 40 years, the world was on tax cut for corporations, was on a com competitive tax cut for corporations. For the last 40 years since Ronald Reagan, since Margaret Thatcher, it was about tax cut and it was this belief that by cutting taxes for corporations, you will gain their support and you will gain, gain their investment. The philosophy behind Janet Allen's global minimum tax and OECD's, uh, I mean, this whole OECD, OECD construct is basically to acknowledge that globally we must not go on competitive tax cut because competitive tax cut hurts states and forces states to reduce public services, for, forces states to, to withdraw the state to the extent that we are now seeing the effect in the United States, in Europe, where because of the collapse of state services, public services, you have populists running the show. Okay? So likewise, this philosophy has to be applied to our thinking here. As a nation, we will have to engage with investors and inform them. This is the philosophy behind a global construct. Let's not cut corner and find ways to give incentive to circumvent global minimum tax. The thinking shouldn't be this. I know that there's a lot of discussions uh, even within government, among industry, to say that, okay, let's find ways to circumvent 
global minimum tax in order to present the state same incentive and tax packages to industry. But that is not the spirit. The spirit is how to strengthen the Malaysian state so that it can provide better education for its people, better ease of doing business, uh, better industrial facilities, better ecosystem to support global industry that invests in Malaysia. So I think that conversation is important. Global minimum tax shouldn't be circumvent, circumvented just because we want to maintain old status quo. We must move our thinking ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Abhi. Thank you.